So our speaker today, as you know, is Matthew Continetti. He is the Director of Domestic Policy Studies and is the inaugural Patrick and Charlene Neal Chair in American Prosperity at the American Enterprise Institute in Washington. Uh, his work is focused on American political thought and history with a particular focus on the development of the Republican Party and the American conservative movement in the 20th century. He's a prominent journalist, analyst, author, and intellectual historian of the right. He was the founding editor and editor-in-chief of the Washington Free Beacon. Previously, he was opinion editor of the Weekly Standard. He's also a contributing editor at National Review and a columnist for Commentary Magazine. Uh, he's been published in numerous publications. He's been all over your TV if, if you are watching any kind of uh, television news. So I'm sure you have seen him, read him uh, in, in some outlet or another before now. He's the author of three books, including most recently, the book he's here to talk about today, The Right, The Hundred Year War for American Conservatism. His previous books were The Persecution of Sarah Palin, How the Elite Media Tried to Bring Down a Rising Star, and the K Street Gang, The Rise and Fall of the Republican Machine. He has a BA in history from Columbia University, and we're absolutely uh, ecstatic to have him here in Atlanta today to talk about this particular aspect of history. So with that, Matthew, thank you for being here. Thank you, Kyle. As you noticed, we did the elbow bump, which I hadn't done in three years, but my kids recently started elementary school again, and that gave me a virus, so I, I woke up this morning and said, I'm coming down to Georgia, but I won't shake any hands. For a second, I thought that I would do the Michael Jackson thing and have, like, the white glove that I could shake hands with, but I thought that might be not the best strategy. Um, I hope you all are having a great day. Uh, it's great to be here in Georgia. Even if you're not having a great day, I just want you to know that however bad your day is, it's not as bad as Aaron Rodgers' day yesterday, playing for the New York Jets and um, break, uh, basically fracturing his, his uh, ankle on the fourth play. And he'll be out for the season. So as Kyle said, my latest book is uh, The Right, The Hundred Year War for American Conservatism. It's a history of the American conservative movement and uh, the conservative movement's relationship to the Republican Party. The book begins in uh, 1921 with Warren Harding's inauguration as president. It ends in January 2021 with Joe Biden's inauguration as president. The paperback version, which is out now, and which I urge you all to buy, you don't have to read it, just buy it, <laughs> is, uh, uh, takes the story up through last year's midterm election. And so today I kind of want to talk about how conservatism, the conservative movement, and the GOP arrived at its present moment, and then in the Q&A we can talk about um, where things might be headed. I'm a historian, I'm not a psychic, so uh, as we look out into the future, I have a motto, all predictions are wrong, or your money back. And that's how we'll, we'll live. So I want to start by trying to define American conservatism. And the truth is, there's no single answer to that question. But the adjective modifying the noun, conservative, provides a clue. American conservatism is exactly that. It's American as opposed to, say, European conservatism. Now, conservatives, as a rule, defend. When the term was born in the late 18th century, European conservatives defended the established institutions in Europe. These are institutions like the monarchy, state church, aristocratic privilege, the national language, the national culture. What about Americans? We have no king, we have no official religion, we have no titled classes. The national language pretty much takes care of itself, indeed it's becoming something of the global language. And our national culture is as multifaceted and wild and eccentric as our population. So what do Americans conserve? Well, here's my answer. I think American conservatives defend the American founding and its ideas of liberty and the familial, communal, and religious institutions that sustain that idea. 
American conservatism must refer to our origin as a country, the American founding, if it is to have any anchor and enjoy any success. But my answer is not the only option. The traditionalists argue that order and justice and religious virtue are of equal value and maybe even superior to freedom. Libertarians take the opposite stand. They value freedom more highly than they do order. For them, freedom is the primary value. Cold warriors, back during our Cold War with the Soviet Union, argued that the preeminent concern of the 20th century was the rise of communism. And that meant a permanent defense establishment and intervention overseas to defeat the Red Menace. Southern agrarians despised capitalism as destructive of the distinctive culture of this region. There are groups called fusionists who said that no, 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 freedom and virtue work in tandem. They work together. There are some very conservative Catholics who think the fusionists are completely wrong that freedom and virtue don't work together, that it just has to be virtue. There are neoconservatives, a name that's often invoked but poorly understood. They looked at all of this in the 1960s and 70s and said, no, 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 if you really want to be a conservative, you have to conserve the New Deal. And then there are the paleoconservatives, who blame the neoconservatives for corrupting the right with statism, immigration, free trade, and foreign intervention and I'm barely scratching the surface of these different camps. Now, none of them were ever as powerful as the other camps believed. And for over a century now, the intellectuals, activists, and politicians have been arguing about the relationship between the Declaration of Independence and the US Constitution, between the place of minority rights in a majoritarian democracy, between the tension between a populist desire for liberty and an elite commitment to our institutions, and between the choice of isolationist protectionism and international involvement. Get two conservatives together, and most likely you're going to have three points of view. Now this fractiousness, I think, contributes to the movement's dynamism. It, the conservative movement has been very adaptable over the past century. It's always been relevant. It's always in the news. But the diversity of opinion within conservatives is often ignored. Does American conservatism represent insiders or outsiders? Are conservatives the elites, the men and women in charge of America's political, economic, social, and cultural institutions, or are conservatives the people, the outsiders? That question of who the conservatives are faces every generation. And it is never, it's a question that's never been answered satisfactorily for very long. For me, the story of American conservatism over the last hundred years is the story of the push and pull between elite intellectual ideas and populist grassroots mobilization against liberal extremism. And conservatives and the conservative movement and the Republican Party have toggled between the elites and the people as they build institutions and professional networks and they've tried to meet over the past hundred years normal people, everyday people, where they are. They try to respond to the voters' ambitions, their passions, and their enmities. Now, no tricks are involved in this dynamic I'm describing. Any successful political movement must incorporate both elites and the people. But only intermittently have conservatives been able to synthesize both parties, the elites and the people. And that, I think, is why conservatism's victories have often been very tenuous and why the conservative coalition is so very fragile. So let me give you an example of an elite intellectual idea. Friedrich Hayek, the Austrian economist, published a book called The Road to Serfdom in England in 1944. It came out in America the following year. It became a huge bestseller. Dedicated to the socialists of all parties, Hayek warned that abandoning freedom for central economic planning would set nations on the primrose path to totalitarianism and dictatorship. Yet books 
even a book as successful as The Road to Serfdom, weren't enough for Friedrich Hayek. He wanted to build an institution devoted to the promotion of economic freedom and individual liberty. He wanted to establish a global network of people who believed like he did, people described as classical liberals. Its first meeting was held in Mont Pelerin, Switzerland, in a conference that opened on April 1st, 1947. On April 10, the attendees agreed to a statement of aims. And the document left no doubt that these beleaguered intellectuals, they really, they filled up a room about as large as this, felt themselves engaged on the losing side in a battle of ideas that had been raging from their point of view for more than a century, stretching back into the 19th century. The statement went something like this, quote, over large stretches of the Earth's surface, the essential conditions of human dignity and freedom have already disappeared. The position of the individual and the voluntary group are progressively undermined by extensions of arbitrary power." Close quote. Now this group became known as the Mont Pelerin Society. Economists have trouble agreeing, and in this case, they had trouble agreeing about what they should call their organization. So they finally just settled on, well, let's just name it after the place where we met. And the Mont Pelerin Society is still active. But Hayek wanted even more. In a 1949 essay called The Intellectuals and Socialism, Hayek described his overall strategy. Ideas drive history, Hayek believed. And thus, intellectuals, what Hayek called professional secondhand dealers in ideas, basically used idea salesmen, were far more important than most people assumed. It's ironic, Hayek went on in this essay, that the, the left so often interprets politics as a clash of economic interests, despite the overwhelming influence that ideas exercise over the climate of opinion. And so to revive individualism and economic freedom, Hayek went on, it was first necessary to inspire the intellectuals, the secondhand dealers of ideas. Now you can see that Hayek's approach was directed at the people running things, the people in the universities, the people in the publishing houses, journalists, people who work at think tanks. And by changing their view of the world, Hayek believed, these individuals would go on to change the political reality. But that would only happen after enough intellectuals became convinced of Hayek's ideals of freedom. So the libertarians associated with Friedrich Hayek turned to education. They wrote great works. They wrote popular pamphlets. They reissued uh, classic liberal texts. Um, they began teaching at universities, like the University of Chicago, as well as in privately funded seminars, to pull the rising generation of elites, of potential intellectuals, of wonks, of elected officials, toward their viewpoint. So these elite-driven strategies, they begin with the work of the intellectuals, the idea people, who then gradually shift the climate of opinion, climate change in a way, by permeating institutions and gradually shaping the views of the rising generation. Another example of this strategy is found in the life of Irving Kristol, the journalist and social philosopher who went from supporting Leon Trotsky in 1942 to endorsing Richard Nixon in 1972. That's quite a journey. Kristol, in the 1960s, became convinced that social science was being put to bad use, and that policymakers needed correction. He and a friend named Daniel Bell launched a quarterly journal. It was called The Public Interest in 1965 as a storehouse for good social science that would show that the plans of social engineers, the plans of the social workers who were manning the ramparts of LBJ's great society, wouldn't turn out as intended. That the law of unintended consequences is as strong as the law of gravity. And so in this magazine, Crystal and Bell wanted to put articles that would show that not only were great society government-run programs not achieving their stated aims, they were often creating 
perverse and unintended results. They were making the problem worse. Now, the public interest never enjoyed a high circulation. Crystal joked that he never wanted the magazine to have more than 700 subscribers, so long as they were the right subscribers. His aim was to affect the policymakers, the elites. And he wasn't interested in money. Many years later, when the internet was taking off, around the year 2000, a young editor at the public interest suggested to Irving Crystal that the magazine create a website where it could put up all the articles that it accumulated over the past 35 years. Crystal grudgingly agreed. Do whatever you want, he said, somewhat ironically, but I just can't stand the thought of all those vulgar people reading my magazine. <laughs> now, the public interest closed its doors in 2005, and over the course of its 40-year lifespan, it showed for its audience that this shibboleth, that government programs are always and everywhere the best ways to reduce inequality and promote social flourishing and happiness, was wrong. Now, this elite-driven strategy I've described with the examples of Hayek and Crystal, it's based on mastery of what one former vice president of the Heritage Foundation once called the decision-making loop. And the loop goes like this. You formulate concepts, then you communicate them to policymakers and slowly watch as theory is translated into practice. But here conservatives faced a dilemma. Since 1932, since the Great Depression, since Franklin Roosevelt's first election and the rise of the New Deal, conservatives in America rarely found themselves in a position of power. So gaining access to the levers of policy where they could put that decision-making loop into practice required another force. It required populism. So what is populism? Well, like with conservatism, there is no easy answer. I take my cues from the late Republican uh, political consultant Jeffrey Bell, an advisor to Ronald Reagan, who wants to find populism as confidence in the decision-making power of everyday people and defined elitism as confidence in the decision-making power of experts. So which group of society do you have confidence in? Everyday people running their own lives or people who have some sort of credential or expertise in a given field? Who do you have confidence in? And popular revolt, which is as old as America itself, takes place when long-standing policies no longer live up to their promise, when elites or experts won't acknowledge or respond to changing circumstances, and when those same elites interfere in private decision-making, especially decision-making within the home, within the family. Populism is a feature of our democracy, and it's a catalyst for political change. And if populism expresses neglected concerns, it draws attention to issues that otherwise would be ignored. And it frames politics <coughs> as a debate between the elites and the people. And whoever is on the side of the people, they tend to win. But I think populism also has drawbacks. If not properly directed, it can descend into the rule of the mob. Populists often sometimes succumb to demagoguery and conspiracy theory, and they can look for scapegoats. Without strong, positive leadership, populism can turn rebellious, even law-breaking. And that's because, really, populism, divorced from conservatism, has no guiding principle other than the people. Yes! But without that guiding principle, we don't really know where the people might go. Populism, the rejection of expert rule, has fueled some of conservatism's greatest victories from the 1960s until today. When experts screw things up or attempt to mess with the kids, populism rears its head and American conservatism has won. 
For much of the 20th and early 21st centuries, really beginning from the period of the end of the 1960s up until the rise of the Tea Party in 2010, conservatism and populism worked in tandem. They were simpatico. But beginning in George W. Bush's second term, around 2006, 2007, that elite-driven conservatism began to diverge from the populist grassroots. And suddenly, it wasn't only liberal elites that American populists began to challenge. It was also conservative and Republican elites as well. I remember the moment this began to happen. And it was during over the debates over immigration reform in George W. Bush's second term. You could already see the divide between the Beltway conservatives and Republicans in office in DC and the grassroots around the country who were against any amnesty of illegal immigrants. But you could also see it, if you look closely enough, in the way, in the kind of the, the movement quality of Ron Paul's two campaigns for president in 2008 and 2012, where he was definitely voicing a um, dissatisfaction with the Bush administration and with the Republicans in Congress uh, that was especially prevalent among young people. You could also see it in the primary elections in 2008 and 2012, when Mike Huckabee in 2008, right, kind of coming out of nowhere, generating a lot of grassroots support, very charismatic communicator. And then in 2012, with Rick Santorum becoming the alternative to Mitt Romney, kind of stressing what he called, Santorum at the time, called a blue-collar conservatism that actually stressed manufacturing jobs, themes that, of course, would only grow louder over time. And the populist divide was unavoidable it loomed like a constellation in the sky during the global financial crisis in 2008 and the great bank bailouts right, that were passed under emergency consideration. So by the time of Barack Obama's presidency, beginning in 2009, the populists were in open revolt against the DC establishment, and that was everywhere. And the Tea Party, went out of its way to target Republicans who were part of that establishment. And they were very successful at it. I also think that the 2012 election in historical terms was a, was a turning point. Because in some ways Mitt Romney was the candidate of that kind of intellectual institutional conservatism. Right? Bain, governor, very successful businessman, speak fluently on any issue, but he lost, and the election was decided quite suddenly, I think much sooner for those of you who recall than many people anticipate. I think many people thought it would be a much closer election in 2012 than actually turned out to be the case. And I think the lessons that some people took from that election was Mitt Romney didn't fight hard enough. He didn't reflect the views of the grassroots enough, and he didn't have the combative spirit that that grassroots was looking for to carry the Republicans into power. And the moment where this was most apparent, and where I see so much, and um, uh, people pay attention to, is the moment in that debate where Mitt Romney failed to challenge the moderator, CNN's Candy Crowley. There are many Republicans grassroots Republicans in particular, who were around at the time and watched that debate, they, they will never forgive Romney for not saying to Kenny Crowley, you're dead wrong, Obama's dead wrong, and let's have that. So not only did Mitt Romney expose the limits of this earlier conservatism, which for much of the 20th century had worked with populists, President Obama's second term, in my view, ushered in a crisis of democratic legitimacy. Obama, if you recall, in, in his second term said, well, I got a pen and a phone. 
and I'm going to do what I want to do. In fact, after the 2014 election, which went so well for the Republicans, Obama gave a press conference where he was asked, well, did you hear from the people, the voters? He said, I heard from the voters. I also heard from all the people who voted for me. And I'm going to listen to those people. <laughs> it was the smack in the face of consensual politics, right? That you're supposed to be responsive to the turns and twi the twists and turns of the electorate. And what issue, of course, did he begin to diverge from the normal pattern but the issue of immigration, which had already been generating such discontent with the border being unpoliced and with all of the social and cultural impacts of immigration accumulating over the first two decades of the 21st century. So Obama had his stated position that he lacked the power to expand his deferred action program, his amnesty for the dreamers, for the, the children who had been brought over uh, by illegal immigrants. And even though he had said something like 30 times, he lacked the authority, he did it anyway. I think that decision convinced the populist grassroots that only an outside disruptor could rebalance the system. That you needed to turn elsewhere, that the normal rules no longer apply. And that's 10 years ago that this was happening. The populists the grassroots found that outsider in the person of Donald Trump. Trump promised to run the government like a business. He, of course, emphasized border security and illegal immigration. And most of all, he represented the antithesis, the direct opposite of Barack Obama in every way that you can imagine. And so his very being, he was going to move the country away from where Obama wanted to, to direct it. International trade was Trump's way of explaining the collapse of the American workforce, the fact that we have many young men, prime age men, in their working years who don't even look for a job. It was also his way of tying um, economics with the growing deaths of despair in this country from opioids and fentanyl and other hard drugs and alcohol. Now, Trump's strongest supporters within the, within the conservative movement came from the network of institutions, spokesmen, and causes that had propelled these populist revivals back in the late 60s and 1970s, back in the 1990s. He was anti-Republican establishment. All the single-issue groups, the pro-life groups, the taxpayer groups, the gun rights groups, they all came to support him as well. Pretty, pretty quickly, because he was promising all of them things. And when Trump became president, he kind of overturned that decision-making loop, right? He kind of was such a disruptor that the people who had been originating the ideas um, or promoting them in the media were kind of thrown out, and a whole new set of people came in. Which is slightly ironic, because many of Trump's most long-lasting policies, it seems to me, will have been policies that the conservative movement as a whole had supported for decades. If you think about things like the tr Trump tax cut, of course his three Supreme Court justices, these were all long-standing concerns of conservatism before it kind of fractured in the way that I've been describing. So what began with Friedrich Hayek back in the early decades of the 20th century as an elite-driven defense of the classical liberal principles that are enshrined in the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution has ended up in the first quarter of the 21st century as a rebellion against elites of all stripes. This which all once again raises the question, what are conservatives to do? What is American conservatism for? As the future unfolds, I believe that conservatives must return to the wisdom of their best minds and advocates. It was William F. Buckley Jr., the editor, founder of National Review Magazine, who said in 1972, I see it as the continuing challenge of American conservatism, quote, to argue the advantages to everyone of the rediscovery of America. 
the amiability of its people, the flexibility of its institutions, of the great latitude that is still left to the individual, the delights of spontaneity, and above all, he wrote, the need for superordinating the private vision over the public one. And this re rediscovery of America must center on America's founding documents. For there would be no American conservatism without the American founding. The Constitution and its amendments ground conservatives eager to preserve and extend the blessings of liberty that are the right of every American. The Constitution grounds conservatives in a uniquely American tradition of political thought that balances individual rights and popular sovereignty through the separation of powers and federalism. The Constitution not only protects human freedom, but it also creates the space for the deeper satisfactions of family, religion, community, and voluntary association. One cannot be an American patriot without reverence for the nation's enabling documents. One cannot be an American conservative without regard for the American tradition of liberty that those documents inaugurated. The philosopher Harvey Mansfield once wrote, America cannot abandon the great principles of classical liberalism, above all the principle of self-government, and with it, the constitutional means for achieving and preserving it. Can conservatives harmonize their principles with the sentiments of populism? Can they reformulate a conservative governing class and an agenda that speaks to everyday Americans for the second quarter of the 21st century. I am confident they can, but when you study conservatism's past as I have, you become convinced that it has a future. Thank you. <laughs>